Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 5th of August 2023. The articles that we have taken today have obviously been displayed on the screen and let us now begin the discussion. So the first article that we have taken has appeared on page number 9. Lok Sabha conducts business even as opposition continues protest. So opposition parties resumed sloganeering and protests over the Manipur situation in the Lok Sabha on Friday despite requests from the government and the speaker to cooperate and discuss bills which is very important function of parliament as they did in the case of Delhi services bill on Thursday now whenever you read news like these it might not hit you as an important article but if you look at the syllabus of GS paper 2 there is a line in the syllabus which says parliament and state legislatures structure functioning conduct of business powers and privileges and issues arising out of these is a part of your syllabus now important aspect of functioning of parliament and conduct of business also includes how regularly parliament is sitting how often do they meet how often do they discuss bills if the bills are being exposed to the highest level of scrutiny whether they are able to hold the executive accountable or not and if it is not then it is a cause for concern and this is just not based on an opinion it is based on facts because if you look at this graph which basically shows the number of sittings in each Lok Sabha you will see that the highest or the tallest building is the first parliament which sat for 677 days and overall trend has been declining to the extent that the 17th Lok Sabha has met only for 230 days and this is obviously a cause for concern because if the less number of days on which the parliament sits or the Lok Sabha sits the less number of time is available for the functions that have been imparted or is expected out of Lok Sabha similarly even if they are able to utilize this time properly then also I think it's a sufficient amount of time but if you look at another graph the situation looks even more grimmer because this graph shows the functioning time as a percentage of scheduled time so even when it sits for 230 days the time utilized is you can see it is really low less than 50 percent and that is what problem is and so in this discussion we will understand the role of the parliament we will understand the instances through which we can gauge that there is a decline in the functioning of parliament we will understand the reasons behind it and also how we can increase the productivity of the parliament so let us now begin the discussion any discussion on productivity of parliament can never be complete without this graph on the y-axis you have number of days yellow belongs to Lok Sabha and green belongs to Rajya Sabha and so it shows that in the initial phases you can clearly see that Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha met on an average for around 160 to 120 days. By the time 2021 came the average number of days on which they are meeting has reduced to around 80. So you can see that there is a clear cut declining trend in the number of days in which Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha both are meeting. And this is just about quantity. This is just about the number of days they are meeting. If you look at the quality, the time spent on debate on legislation in 2021, Lok Sabha has worked for only 236 hours, whereas the same figure for Rajya Sabha happened to be around 179 hours per year, which further comes out to be around 15 to 20 hours per month of work. And so this is a clear-cut case or cause of concern for all of us now before we go on and understand what are the other instances which lead us to believe that the productivity of parliament has declined we should first at the very basic be understanding as to why is it important for us to ensure productivity of the parliament or what are the functions of the parliament because of which higher productivity is needed and if it is not being yielded we are concerned and if we talk about parliament and its role in our democracy and the first and foremost role that it plays is the accountability of the executive article 74 to the constitution of india 
has enabled a parliamentary democracy in our country which means that the council of minister headed by prime minister or in short the elected executive is accountable to the house of the people and so that is one of the most important work that has been given to the parliament and this role particularly has been given to the house of the people then the second important role of parliament in india is as a legislature or as a house which enables the legislation or law making and so parliament is expected to examine all legislative proposals in detail understand their nuances and implications of the provision and decide on the appropriate way forward then there is another very important role which has been given to the parliament and that is about providing representation to the people it works as a representative body while lok sabha represents common people rajya sabha represents the interests of the states and that is the reason why lok sabha is known as house of the people and rajya sabha is known as council of states now if parliament is not meeting regularly then definitely it is compromising on the three main functions which have been given to it which is about enforcing collective accountability on executive proper law making and providing representation to the people and states now the obvious question is that whenever you observe a trend there has to be a reason behind it and so what is the reason and what are the indicators behind declining trend of parliamentary productivity how do we know apart from these hours of meeting and days of meeting how do we know that parliamentary productivity is deed declining and we know that because of a lot of instances which clearly show this trend for example there is absolute absence of bill scrutiny for example during the budget session 13 bills were introduced in the house and not even one of them was referred to a parliamentary committee for examination and we can understand the consequences of not thinking through a bill properly these bills once become an act govern the whole country and if they are not properly investigated researched dissected especially in a parliamentary committee a lot of issues with the act will definitely arise and the best example to showcase this is gn ctd amendment bill 2021 then the next clear cut demonstrator of declining parliamentary productivity is a lack of discussion of union budget where rightly lok sabha should debate on each and every demand which has been tabled by or for each and every ministry but in recent budget session the government listed the budget of just five ministries for detailed discussion and in essence around 76% of the union budget was approved without any debate or discussion now you can understand that this defeats the whole mechanism which was created to enforce financial accountability on the government otherwise the constitutional makers would have directly given the power to withdraw money to the government from the consolidated fund of india but exactly for the same reason government did not do it because they wanted to have some kind of check over the government of india so that each and every penny and each and every rupee which goes out of the consolidated fund is approved by the lok sabha then the third important aspect of law making and debating is the role played by parliamentary committees and if you have gone through even the basics of the book on polity you might have realized that these parliamentary committees are very very important part of the legislative work because the parliament as a body is so vast and it's so diverse that it is simply not possible for it to take up each and every legislative matter and hence there are a lot of parliamentary committees which have been enacted or created to take care of matters in detail and that is why there are parliamentary committees which exist throughout the year and they develop a specialization on various topics of governance and uh, law making and it's obviously a good idea to first send the draft to the respective parliamentary committees give them time to work upon them and then wait for their feedback and on the basis of the feedback provided by the parliamentary committees which have distribution which is quite similar and representation which is quite similar to the parliament 
wait for their feedback and their report and once their reports are tabled on the floor of the house then the discussion is well informed but the number of bills referred to committee has dipped sharply to just one third in 16th Lok Sabha and 10% in 17th Lok Sabha. And so the obvious question is why the parliamentary productivity is declining? See, ideally, constitution provides mechanism so that parliament can control executive. But it is the other way around. Actually, if a party commands or a coalition commands majority in the lower house, then actually they are the one who are driving or running the agenda of the house. And so, when the government commands absolute majority, there is nothing really to keep the government into check or into account. And so, when unresponsive government becomes insensitive to the demands of the opposition members, it leaves with no other option for the opposition members to resort to frequent disruptions because all the tools or the mechanisms which are provided, like adjournment motion, like no confidence motion, like any other kind of motion, they require at least the majority of the members of the house present in voting to be enabled or to be activated. Because of which, there is a dissatisfaction amongst members, among members of parliament because of inadequate time for airing their grievances. Then all of this is happening because the sitting hours and all other legislative agenda of either Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha are neither fixed by the House themselves nor have been fixed by the Constitution, but rather they are driven by the government. And so the intention of the government is reflected in the way Parliament is functioning. Then finally, there is an absence of prompt action against disrupting MPs. So how to increase the productivity? What are the steps that we can suggest in order to increase the productivity of the parliament? Because we have understood that it is extremely, it's of vital importance for our overall democratic framework. So the first and foremost, no one can deny that there is a need to increase the number of the sittings. And in this regard, National Commission to review the working of the constitution had recommended that the minimum number of sittings for Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha should be fixed at 120. That should be the constitutional obligation. Of course, you cannot make them work but at least you can force them to come to the office and sit for at least 120 days that might lead to some improvement then no one can deny the fact that there is dearth of research support to the members although legislative staff is provided to the parliamentary committees but there is a need for us to provide such kind of a support to each and every member because we have to understand that these members come from all kind of background. Some of them might not be educated. Some of them might not have experience in legislative work. And so we need to provide them with research support. People who qualify in examination, just like UPSC, and become the support staff to the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha and allocated to each and every member so that whenever a member asks them to conduct a research on a particular topic, they are able to come up with a substantive report which then can be utilized by the members to table his or her views in the house then there is a need for making it mandatory for each and every bill to be sent to the particular committee requiring that all bills and budgets will be definitely examined by a particular committee will definitely have a lot of improvement in the amount and the quality of the debate in the lower as well as in the upper house at the same time, there is a need for regular monitoring through an institutional mechanism. And then finally, there needs to be an active opposition. Members must question, object and suggest alternative course of action on each and every legislative matter suggested by the government. And this is what is followed in UK in the form of shadow cabinet. where. Corresponding to each and every executive, each and every minister, there is a shadow minister from the opposition who comes up with the alternative mechanism for every field, just to show that how better they could be if they were provided with an opportunity to handle the governance by the people. The next topic of discussion deals with Israel-Palestine issue and it has appeared on two distinct pages in today's newspaper. 
First is of course on editorial page which is not absolutely about Israel-Palestine issue but is one of the foundations of the Saudi-Israel rapprochement. And the second one directly deals with the conflict where Palestinians have decided to bury 18 year old who was killed in West Bank by Israeli forces. So while this is directly related to what's going on in the Middle East, the second one mentions at two places this particular conflict and so you can understand how important Israel-Palestine conflict is and especially when we start preparing for UPSC civil services examination, we don't have enough clarity about this conflict. And whenever you read an article on Israel-Palestinian conflict, always there are terms like Golan Heights, Gaza Strip, West Bank and terms like Israeli settlements. And so it is very, very difficult for beginners and aspirants to understand these terms. And in order to be able to understand that, you have to go through complicated history which has to be simplified and daily news simplified is all about that. So today we will understand first what is the historical context into Israel-Palestinian conflict which will enable you to understand all the news articles which appear henceforth. And so in order to be able to understand what is happening right now, we will have to go back in history to the time when there was extreme persecution of Jews which resulted in the migration of Jews from Europe and various other parts of the world to Palestine which led to the passage of UN resolution which were followed by two important wars which were fought by Israel and Arabian countries 1948 Arab-Israel war and Israel six-day war. So now the current map of Israel and Palestine which you see on Google map or on world map today is something which did not exist 100 years ago because 100 years ago there were very few Jews who lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Most of them had already migrated to various European cities and countries. But the problem was that wherever Jews went, they had to face extreme persecution both from Muslims as well as from Christians. And hence a movement emerged among Jews living in European countries which took up the cause of persecution and talked about escaping this persecution. It actively talked about creation of a state solely or only meant for Jews. And this particular movement came to be known as Zionist movement. So basically Jews were persecuted in European countries. They decided they will gather, unite and move to location on earth where they will establish their own state which will be just for them. And the place which was identified by them was Palestine. And so once it was decided that Palestine will be the place where they will set up their own country, they started to migrate. But the question arises, how could this migration take place? Now they could migrate because of special situation which was created as a result of World War I. If you know the context of World War I, you know that as a result of it, the Ottoman Empire which controlled the most of the region of the Middle East disintegrated as a result of World War I. And as the settlement of World War I, the administration of the Palestinian region was handed over to the British people. And you can see the Palestine in the red color marked over here and you can see that under British, French and Russian protection. And this particular arrangement where British, French and Russian governments decided to trifurcate the whole region among themselves is known as sykes picot Agreement. So two things happened simultaneously in favor of Jews. The disintegration of Ottoman Empire, an empire which claimed to be the protector of the Muslims. The existence of such an empire would have prevented the inflow of Jews to this particular region because it was controlled by a very very powerful Ottoman Empire which disintegrated in 1915 to 16 and at the same time the territory Palestine which was identified under the Zionist movement will be the place where all the Jews will migrate fell under the British occupation and Britishers since the beginning were quite sympathetic to the cause of the Jews protection and their persecution but as soon as the world war ended and a new set of governments started to form in Europe, another factor was added into the migration or giving a big boost to the migration of Jews from Europe to the Palestine, which was emergence of a lot of fascist governments across Europe. One of them you know is Hitler, another one was Mussolini and so what you have across Europe is wide level of persecution which extended well beyond Germany. And so as more and more fascist and anti-Jews government rose up in Europe, the persecution of Jews reached unprecedented level not even seen during medieval times. 
and this resulted into the kind of migration which was never seen by Jews in the history. So now, starting with Zionist movement as reason number two, disintegration of Ottoman Empire and occupation of Palestine by Britishers and third is that now you have fascist regime which were actively persecuting Jews which was unseen before. And so as a combined result of all these factors, the more and more number of Jews started arriving in a very very small territory of Palestine which was earlier mainly populated by Arab Muslims. And so what you have till 1947 is that this Palestinian territory is just receiving more and more number of Jews flowing in from Germany, from Sweden, from France and from various other places in Europe and they are just arriving and making up their own homes inside Palestine because this particular territory is controlled by British, they are allowing the people to come in. But by the time 1947 and 1948 came, a massive alarm was raised by local Arabs because now they were concerned about the increasing population of Jews and they started an armed militant movement against the in-migrants or the Jews. And so this of course resulted in a retaliation from Jewish side and this led to a lot of violence in the one particular year from 1947 to 48. But now it is 1947-48 and World War II has already ended. And now the Britishers had made up their mind to vacate the Middle East, including the Palestinian region. And so they decided to establish a proper state which the world would recognize as Israel or nation state for Jewish people. And hence United Nations Security Council passed a resolution in which voted to split the earlier Palestinian region into three states. One Arab state, another one Jewish state and the third one would be the Jerusalem city. And so this UN resolution was passed in 1947 and this resolution is known by the name of UN resolution number 181. And so now is the time to understand how the map of Palestine changed after this particular resolution. So you can clearly see that there are three colors in this map. Blue denotes the Jewish regions, pinkish orange color denotes the Arab regions and the yellow one is international city of Jerusalem. So this was the condition starting 1948. And so this was the first time when the boundaries were actually drawn in the state of Palestine. So earlier what you had was complete Palestine owned and possessed and habited, populated by Arabs. But after the resolution, what you have is a trifurcation of the same state into three parts. You can see clearly that Jews were given a lot of territory and Arabs were made limited to just the orangish areas. And so this was the first time when the Jews got the legal right, recognition from across the world to make up their own home state or home nation. So as you can totally understand, it's quite commonsensical what would have been the reception of this UN resolution. It was wholeheartedly accepted by Jews because since 100 years there was a demand among the Jews for their own home state, which they finally got through UN resolution number 181. But as far as Arabs are concerned, they completely rejected the UN resolution. It's not difficult to think why the response was such, because the earlier territory which completely belonged to them. 50% more than 50% of that was given to Jews and so they not only rejected the UN resolution but at the same time they said that any further talks would not be entertained and we are going to fight it back and take it away from the Jews. And so here now what you have is genesis of one of the world's most cluttered and disputed territories. When the Arabs rejected the United Nations resolution, they also promised with each other that they are going to win back the areas which have been given to the Jews, which resulted in a lot of wars. But we are going to keep ourselves limited to 1948 Arab-Israel war and Israel's six-day war. Because these are the two wars which have resulted into drastic changes in the map of the Israel and Palestine and these are the locations which are frequently asked in UPSC prelims examination and through this discussion you will understand the importance of each and every territory. So in 1948, following the declaration of the State of Israel, the group of Arab nations known as Arab League decided to intervene on behalf of their Palestinian brothers. By ordering their troops and military to marching into the areas of Palestine, especially those areas which were given to the Jews. Overall, the war was quite prolonged, but Israel emerged victorious because it not only retained its own mandate, it not only retained the territories which were allocated to it through UN resolution, but it was also able to capture around 60% of the territory which was given to the Arab people. 
So now after the end of this war, the Jews extended their area of control within Palestinian region. And so for next 10 to 15 years, things remained almost the same until in 1967 when Israel fought six day war with its surrounding neighbors which was actually started by Israel because Israel had this kind of premonition that the neighboring states are going to attack it. And so Israel started conducting preemptive strikes on Egypt, Syria and Jordan. And the interesting outcome of the war was not just that it defeated the combined armies of Egypt, Syria and Jordan, but Israel also managed to get control over some of the most strategically important points in Egypt, Syria and Jordan, which would then go a long way in defending Israel in future. So for example, it captured completely Sinai Peninsula and Gaza Strip. It took away Golan Heights which are located over here from Syria and then it took West Bank which can be seen marked in the blue color over here and East Jerusalem from Jordan. So before the beginning of the war, Israel was just limited to the area which I am shading in blue color. It did not have Gaza Strip, it did not have Sinai Peninsula, it did not have West Bank, it did not have Syrian region of Golan Heights which are very very important strategically to protect Israel from Syria. But after the war ended, the Israel had access to Suez Canal through Sinai Peninsula. It completely controlled West Bank, Gaza Strip and also the Golan Heights. Now of course the current map of Israel does not show Sinai Peninsula as a part of Israel. And so that is because Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in response to Egypt becoming the first country, first Muslim country to recognize the existence of Israel as a formal state. So that was like a quid pro quo. You recognize us and we'll give back your territory to you. But it has held on, stuck to the other territories even now. It still controls Gaza Strip and West Bank. It still controls most of the Jerusalem. Now whenever you read the news about Israel and Palestine, this is the one term because of which the news appears and that is called the settlements of Israeli people in Palestine. So what are these settlements? Of, of course the Jewish people are settling in this particular region since more than 80 years now. And so what is this new stuff known as settlements? So settlements are basically civilian establishments for Jews. But they are known as settlements, there is a particular term settlement is used only for those colonies which are built on land occupied by Israel after 1967 war. So if you make a house or a home or a colony inside this particular region, there is no trouble. But we know that in 1967, Israel occupied and started controlling the West Bank as well. And so what Israel does is that it comes up with new colony here, expelling the Arabs from that particular region. And this has seen a continuous upswing in past 10 years, especially with the election of Mr. Netanyahu, who has been extremely, extremely nationalist in his outlook and approach towards the Arab people. So now this is a clear violation of UN resolution because the UN resolution limited the Jews only to the region which was allocated to them. But now these Jewish people have started to make their homes inside the Arabian territories as well. And so now what you see on the screen is a gradual transformation of Israel's ethnicity in terms of the occupation. And so the light green color in the dark background shows the continuous reduction in the area populated by Arabs and you can see a drastic decline after 1960 because then in 1970 onwards Israel's national government started to take up the colonies earlier settled by Arab people, expelled them because they have brute force on the ground and now they are making up territories, colonies and occupations inside the Palestinian lands. So these settlements have led to a lot of violence in this particular region. Now after having gone through this discussion, go back and read the newspaper and specifically these two articles and let us know in the comment section, do they make more sense now? The next article that we have taken is again very very important from the perspective of especially prelims polity section. Roe over Kerala speaker's remarks, CPIM secretary denies terming deities myth. So the ruling Communist Party of India CPIM in Kerala scrambled to defend itself against a growing chorus of accusations discomfortingly amplified, discomfortingly amplified on social media that top party leaders broadcast a disdainful view of Hindu beliefs while not daring to question the articles of faith cherished by other religions. And this row was triggered by the Speaker of a Legislative Assembly. And 
very often you will find news related to the speakers and deputy speakers their actions their statements because they are very very powerful for all what we have heard or we might have heard about whether speaker or deputy speaker is not so powerful position but in the indian constitution and indian legal context speaker have acquired a lot of powers and that is what the matter of discussion today is so for conducting the proceeding of the house each house for example in case of india we have rajya sabha and lok sabha has its very own set of presiding officers while in case of rajya sabha we have chairman and deputy chairman on the other hand in case of lok sabha we have speaker and deputy speaker at the same time it is important for us to understand as to when these offices came into existence was it uh, after the independence or these offices have been continuing even prior to independence most of you might be knowing that these positions came into existence through the government of india act 1919 and for the first time these offices were constituted in year 1921 and so in year 1921 frederick white and sachidanand sinha were appointed as speaker and deputy speaker respectively by the governor general of india and so here one important or key element which you cannot miss out is that they were appointed by the governor general of india but not elected by the council and so the obvious question is that who was the first indian to be elected as the speaker of the council and that was vittal bhai j patel in 1925 so these are very uh, preliminary level facts which you should keep in mind so let's now move on to the actual provisions related to speaker and deputy speaker so what you see on screen is the complete provisions related to deputy speaker and speaker while provisions related to speaker have been written on the left hand side and provisions related to deputy speaker have been written on the right hand side let us now start the discussion by understanding the manner of election of both of them so of course all of us know that they are elected by the members of the lok sabha and of course as soon as either of the position of deputy speaker or speaker falls vacant a re election has to be conducted Now here is a key difference between speaker and deputy speaker with respect to who is the one responsible for notifying the re-election. While in case of speaker, the notification is issued by president, but on the other hand, in case of deputy speaker, it is notified by the speaker himself or herself. Then of course, after election, it's very obvious to talk about the removal procedure, and as you can see on both. left and right side whatever has been written is same so the process of removal of both speaker and deputy speaker are exactly the same except for a very minute difference which is speaker resigns and gives or tenders his resignation to deputy speaker whereas deputy speaker tenders his or her resignation to the speaker apart from that these two conditions that if a person ceases to be a member of lok sabha ceases to be speaker or deputy speaker or he or she is removed by a resolution of the house that is when they stop being the speaker or deputy speaker now it is important for us to understand that this removal through resolution of the house should be passed by majority of all the then members of the house let us know in the comment box what does this term the then members of the house means and majority of the then members what does it denote so this is absolutely common for speaker as well as deputy speaker so the only difference for you to recall is that the speakers and deputy speaker resign by tendering their resignation to each other so we are done with election and removal but what about their powers now since these posts are constitutional in nature of course they are going to derive their power majorly from the constitution of india however constitution of india is not the only source of power for these two bodies or chairs of course you have rules of procedure and conduct of business rules of each house and then you have a lot of parliamentary conventions somewhat sort of a precedent which have become the source of power for these two posts so there are three sources of power for these two posts which is of course common to both of them now rules of procedure and conduct of business is a kind of rule book which has been designed by the lok sabha itself to guide the business and proceedings of the house so they are written in nature whereas on the other hand parliamentary conventions are a set of unspoken rules or precedents which are not written in nature but this is what has been happening since the time of independence so in future if certain similar circumstances emerge 
exactly that has to be followed by the speaker or the deputy speaker but there is no legal force which exists to enforce the convention rules on speaker or deputy speaker now here it is important for you to understand that deputy speaker is going to perform his or her duties only when the speaker is absent from the house Deputy Speaker performs such actions of Speaker when the post of Speaker lies vacant. In either of the cases, when Deputy Speaker is performing the role of Speaker, Deputy Speaker has all the powers which the Speaker is entitled to. Not just that, if Speaker is absent from the joint sitting of both the houses, then in that case also, Speaker chairs the joint sitting of the both the houses. That of course brings us to what are the detailed powers of this post. Since both Speaker and Deputy Speaker are presiding officers of the House, their main task is maintenance of order and decorum on the floor of the House, so that the business of the House can be conducted in orderly fashion. And this you can say is the primary responsibility of presiding officers. And they have final power, they have final judgment over these calls that they take. Then the next important task which uh, speaker and deputy speaker presiding officers have is the interpretation. They are the final interpreters of not only the constitutional provisions but also rules of procedure and conduct of business and the parliamentary conventions. If you are reading the newspaper regularly, you must have seen the members of parliament fighting very often entering into altercation with respect to their differing interpretations of either rules and procedure or parliamentary convention. Now in all those cases, the speaker or deputy speaker, whoever may be the presiding officer at that point of time, becomes the final interpreter as to what is going to happen. Another very significant power of presiding officer is casting vote. Now of course all of us know that presiding officers do not and cannot vote in the first instance. But they can definitely exercise their casting vote in case of a tie. So if there is a resolution or a bill where both the sides have equal number of votes, then presiding officer can take or choose one of the sides. And that becomes the decider. Such a vote becomes a casting vote and it is exercised to remove a deadlock in the house. Then you must have seen a lot of meetings and proceedings of Lok Sabha being adjourned or suspended or kept in suspended animation. And the final authority to either adjourn or suspend is vested in the presiding officer of the house. So the suspension of the meeting or adjournment of the meeting can take place if there is no quorum in the house. So all of us know that quorum of the house is one tenth of the total membership of the house. So if let's say the, the total membership of house is 545, which means that at least 55 members have to be present in order to conduct the proceedings of the house. And if this minimum number is not achieved in a particular meeting, then speaker will call off that particular meeting. Apart from that, if proceedings of a particular meeting are not being conducted in a peaceful manner, there is a lot of chaos on the floor of the house or altercation, then also the presiding officer can adjourn the meeting. Then of course all of us know and we have seen in the recent DNS how the presiding officer of a house is the final authority in case of anti-defection law and disqualifications under anti-defection law. So all the decisions under the provisions of the 10th schedule to the constitution of India are taken by the presiding officer. Then another very very important aspect is the categorization or labeling of a particular bill as the money bill. And Speaker of the Lok Sabha has the final authority to categorize a particular bill as a money bill. And his or her decision on this matter is absolutely final. And it is very very important because once a bill is categorized as a money bill, the opinion of Rajya Sabha becomes irrelevant on that matter. And so this provision has been very often used by uh, the government uh, who does not have majority in Rajya Sabha to bypass the second house or the council of states and directly send it to the president for his or her approval. And of course, the last one we have seen that the presiding officer of Lok Sabha, either speaker or deputy speaker, they chair the joint sitting of both the houses. If speaker is not present, then deputy speaker will chair. But if deputy speaker is not present, let us know in the comment section who is the one who is going to preside the joint sitting of both the houses. Now, having looked at the powers of the position of presiding officer of Lok Sabha, you can understand that it is a very, very crucial to the successful functioning of Lok Sabha and hence in some ways the democracy of our country. And so of course, 
A lot of protections have also been provided to this post. And so, the salaries and allowances of presiding officer, speaker and deputy speaker are fixed by the parliament and not by the government. Apart from that, the expenditures incurred by the houses are the expenditures charged on the Consolidated Fund of India and hence not subject to the voting every year at the time of the annual budget. And so through this way, the constitution has made sure that these houses as well as the position of speaker and deputy speaker continue to function in somewhat independent or autonomous manner. Then of course comes a very important aspect which is about the security of the tenure of these posts. Because the presiding officer, speaker or deputy speaker can be removed only by a resolution passed by the absolute majority of the house and not by the government. Apart from that, if he or she discontinues to be a member of the Lok Sabha, then of course they do not have the right to become the speaker or continue as a speaker or a deputy speaker. And because this removal is through absolute majority and not by the general majority of the then members present and voting, it is really difficult to remove them once they are elected. Of course, they can be removed if the ruling coalition has the sufficient amount of numbers, but otherwise they cannot be removed just by the whims of the government. Apart from that, the motion for the consideration of removal of the presiding officer can be considered only when it has the support of 50 members of the house which of course is a very high cutoff for the preliminary stage of removal of the presiding officer. Now apart from this, we know that there is an absolute immunity to the members of the house when they are speaking within the confines of the house. They can utilize this opportunity to even criticize and mount pressure on the presiding officers. And it's specifically because of that, their work and conduct cannot be discussed on the floor of the house, except when the resolution or motion of their removal is under discussion, except that barring that their functioning, their work cannot be discussed or criticized on the floor of the house. Apart from that, a very, very high position has been allocated to the speaker of the house in the order of the precedence. She is placed at seventh rank in the order of precedence list, along with the chief justice of India. So you can see that the constitutional position of the Speaker of Lok Sabha is same as that of Chief Justice of India. And so you can see that the place which has been accorded to the Lok Sabha is of course lower than the President, Vice President, Prime Minister and the Governors. But it is higher than the Cabinet Ministers, Chief Ministers and other Judges of the Supreme Court. And this could be one of the prelims question where the statement could be framed like Chief Justice of India and Speaker of Lok Sabha are accorded the same order of precedence. The last article for today has appeared on page number one and deals with a very important dance form known as Kalbelia, which is native to the Rajasthan state of our country. And this is very, very important from the perspective of art and culture, especially in prelims. So the dance indigenous to Rajasthan region of India, specifically linked to the Kalbelia tribe, is recognized as Kalbelia dance. And so if one of the option is that it derives its name from the tribe, it's true. This traditional performance, alternatively referred as Sapera dance or snake charmer dance, showcases the artistic expression of Kalbelia community. Notably, this dance and the associated melodies from Rajasthan gained global recognition, earning a spot on UNESCO's prestigious Register of Intangible Cultural Heritage of Humanity in 2010. Within the Kalbelia dance, male individuals engage with customary musical instruments while the female members execute the choreography. This dance form is notably regarded as one of the most captivating amongst all Rajasthani dances. The origin of Kalbelia dance lies within the cultural heritage of Kalbelia tribe residing in Rajasthan. Historically, these nomadic people led a migratory lifestyle preferring mobility over permanent settlement. The Kalbelia tribe was historically linked to snake catching and trade of snake venom, often recognized as sapera or snake charmers. The traditional Kalbelia folk dance predominantly features female performances who synchronize their movements with the enchanting melodies of the bean, a traditional musical instrument. This dance is an integral part of joyful occasions within the Kalbelia community. Unlike structured educational systems, formal manuscripts or documented instructions, Kalbelia songs and dance routines are transferred through generations via oral tradition, maintaining the essence of this folk art alive.